Well, hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Joan Devine. I am the former director of education with Pioneer Network and very proud to be part of the team with CFI, who's working on the 2024 uh, CFI conference, and very excited that we have added something to our conference agenda this year, which is pre-conference webinars. And this is uh, the second we have done, and so happy to have uh, Jen Bruning and Jennifer Stelter with us here for today's Rethinking, we th excuse me, my signs in the way, Rethinking the Dining Environment, Optimizing Outcomes for Residents with Dementia. Jen, if you show us the next slide, we'll get the paperwork out of the way and get right down to this. We are offering continuing education for nursing home administrators, as well as for nurses. Um, also for certified dementia practitioners, if there is anyone on, uh, they can just pop something in the chat and let us know. Um, all individuals seeking CEs must attend the entire program. Um, and there is a post-webinar evaluation that is required for nurses. And I wanted to let you know that there is no conflict of interest. And that takes care of the um, that takes care of the uh, paperwork side of it. So I'm very excited. Uh, to introduce our speakers. I did want to let you know during the webinar, if you have questions, please ask them on the Q&A box, or you can also, you can, uh, they may ask you something in the chat, but the Q&A is probably the best place to save your data. So that being said, I'm going to turn it over to Jen and Jennifer and looking forward to a wonderful webinar. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joan, and thank you to all of you who are joining us today. We know that if you are involved in the care of individuals with dementia, whether that is on the caregiver side or on the side in skilled nursing or memory care, uh, that your time is very precious. So we really appreciate your time and we really value that. And we hope that you can take so much from our presentation today. I also want to, ch uh, to thank the folks at CFI for the opportunity to get in front of you. I think the idea of a pre-conference session to really get folks uh, excited, ready to go for the in-person conference is a wonderful idea, really helps to round out what you're able to provide to folks. So I think that's a wonderful thing. And Dr. Stelter and I are so pleased to be able to present to you our, our session here on Rethinking Dining for Residents with Dementia, a multi-sensory approach. As Joan said, uh, my name is Jen Bruning. I'm a registered dietitian with Insight Strategic Partners. I have recently gone through a little bit of a job change to be the Director of Partner Education, which is why I'm so pleased to be here with you today. And joining me is Dr. Jennifer Stelter, who is the founder of the Dementia Connection Institute. She will give a little more background on herself when we uh, change over speakers here about halfway through. So with that, we will dive into today's objectives. So we, uh, we have a few objectives for you, this being continuing education, of course. We're hoping that by the end of this presentation, you will be able to really describe the need for a nutritious, well-rounded diet for those living with dementia and the consequences that can come with PO intake. We also hope that you will take away at least three foods, food components or nutrients that are shown to improve cognitive health and really support physical health um, as well in those living with dementia. And finally, understand the evidence-based sensory techniques in offering an effective wellness dining program, which is well where Dr. Stelter will share her information in the second half of the presentation today. A quick agenda, uh, you'll be with me for the first three bullet points today, defining dementia with stages and statistics as a quick review of this condition. Talk a little bit about nutrition for prevention and delay of onset of dementia. And that's a segment where I really hope that those of you in attendance can um, take some information home, not just for your residents, but for yourselves, for your loved ones, because there's so much in the nutrition world that can help to support healthier aging and help to delay the onset of something like dementia. Um, finally, for my section, we'll talk about nutrition for individuals living with dementia, and then transition over to Dr. Stelter to talk about some of those prevalent eating challenges within dementia care, which are so numerous that we really wanted to take a moment and review all those things, the, all the different aspects and, and dimensions this can take. And then Dr. Stelter will round us out talking through her wellness dining program of research um, and then the eating interventions and multi-sensory approach that that encapsulates. All right. 
So <clears throat> if you're attending this webinar, chances are you already have a pretty firm grasp of what dementia looks like um, and you know all the different stages and things like that. But I did wanna give you a quick review of those, uh, those things uh, so that we're all kind of starting from the same place of information. I also think it's really interesting how much information is out there looking ahead to what dementia can mean, uh, both on a national level here in the US as well as globally. So we'll talk about that a bit too. <clears throat> Pardon me. All right, so what is dementia exactly? We hear this term thrown about, oftentimes interchanged with the term Alzheimer's. So it's important, I think, as practitioners for all of us to have a firm understanding that when we say dementia, we're really talking about a general term that's referring to loss of memory, language, problem solving skills, and general thinking abilities that are severe enough to interfere with everyday life. One of the reasons why we hear Alzheimer's used so interchangeably so often is because it's thought to comprise anywhere from 60 to 80 percent of dementia cases globally. But there's really important um, nuances to some of the differences with the different types of dementia. And it's important to know as well what type of dementia we may be dealing with with an individual, because it could be something like vascular dementia. It comes with its own set of uh, health concerns, Lewy body dementia, frontotemporal dementia, things like that. And especially frontotemporal dementia, I'd like to mention right now because we've heard a lot more about this specific dementia lately because there's been some very prominent high profile individuals in the entertainment industry whose families have been forthcoming about sharing those individuals' diagnosis, what their life kind of looks like. And <clears throat> pardon me, I have to give props to those families and individuals because I think that keeping the, con the, the conversation about dementia at the forefront and being able to be open really helps to enhance a general understanding of what this can be like for families and individuals um, and really helps to open the conversation up so that people don't feel quite so alone and just increase the knowledge base. All right. So moving here on to the stages of dementia, the mild or the early stage is when we start to notice with either ourselves or another individual who we're familiar with that an individual is having a hard time remembering things like names or things that are just read. Um, things like planning, organizing, performing their work tasks. And this can be such a challenging time because I, I wish I could see all your faces. Normally I would say, raise your hand if you've ever had a day where your memory just doesn't seem to be keeping up. Maybe it's a high stress day. Maybe it's a very busy day. It can be very challenging to kind of discern if this is something unusual that has now taken place with an individual versus just something like a high stress day. So really it's more of a pattern of these things uh, occurring in someone with whom they didn't occur before. As an individual moves into the moderate or middle stage of dementia, this is when we start to see a little bit clearer, more overt symptoms that are unusual for an individual. This is when we start to see someone, you know, maybe still being able to function around the home and, and have those similar patterns that they usually have, but we might start to see things like wandering, you know, leaving the home um, at an abnormal time of day with a, with a, uh, a very different understanding of what they think they're experiencing in that moment. This happens, you know, during, um, the, during the night hours, things like that, when a person would normally be sleeping. We might also see things like personality changes or mood changes. Um, if you are at all a TV watcher, there's a chance you've seen some of the ads for different drug interventions that can help with some of this, um, but it really helps to kind of illustrate what is meant by those changes in personality. It's really much more than just a bad mood that doesn't last. Um, these are behaviors that are very atypical for the individual. We mentioned about wandering, it can happen in the night, sleep changes go right along with that. So a difference in um, when a person is waking and sleeping, maybe confusion about what time of day they're actually in. You may get those middle of the night phone calls saying, I thought you were picking me up to go shopping, you know, things like that if you're on the caregiving side. Um, like we said, time of day, confusion about date, location, what season that we're in. This is where things like the mini mental exams can help to pick up on some of these things if a person doesn't realize what year it is, who the president is, things like that. And we can start to see a little bit more compulsion as well as delusions or suspiciousness. Um, if a person is experiencing um, 
something like maybe they live in a home with a spouse or another family member, and they may not recognize that individual. And it could be because they are picturing someone from a much younger age than they are now decades later. So there's a lot of um, things uh, like those delusions that can kind of come up and and a, a person can be experiencing something in such a real way for them. Um, so that's when we can really start to see those more moderate stage um, uh, symptoms and things like that. Moving into the later stage, this is when we really see folks requiring round the clock assistance. Um, there's a lot of changes in physical abilities here. Maybe their ability to walk is really impacted. Maybe being able to sit straight up in a chair is really challenging as the mechanisms in the brain that control our muscle movement start to change. It may not even always be physical weakness that's, that's occurring. It really can be the signaling pathways that tell a person's body how to take steps, how to go from sitting to standing. Um, those are things that can become impaired as the person is entering these later stages of dementia. We start to see a different um, challenges in communicating here as well, uh, more um, ch being stuck on a few different words, not being able to form sentences, things like that. Um, a real loss of awareness of surrounding um, their, their surroundings. And we start to see some of their changes in ability to eat as well. We um, may have already seen challenges in their ability to feed themselves, but at this late stage, we may also start to see difficulties with chewing and swallowing, which makes them more difficult, excuse me, more vulnerable to pneumonia as well. When we have um, an inability to properly masticate our food and swallow safely, again, it's these um, things that are just occurring as the brain is going through the stages of dementia, where the muscles that are in control of a safe swallowing mechanism become impaired. So that's when we can start to see this. I, I looked into some research because I was curious to know if there was an average stage at which individuals move into senior living for that more supportive care. And what I found was that there really isn't. Um, trying to find an average when it comes to dementia, it turns out is really challenging uh, because there's such a wide variety of uh, the, the ways in which this disease presents, the impairments it causes, um, and the amount of support that a person requires. Part of the, the determination of when a person is admitting into senior care, again, this is so variable, but it's essentially when care cannot be adequately provided at home, which seems pretty obvious, but that can really run the gamut. Um, an individual may live alone and start to um, really start to notice impacts of things like um, if they're still driving, maybe they can't find the grocery store and they can't shop for themselves. Maybe they're unable to cook as some of those um, skills start to diminish. Maybe there is fear. Maybe there's family members who are encouraging them and saying, you know, we live too far away. It's a smart move to decide now to move in. That could be at a very early stage. Whereas then we may have somebody on the other end of that spectrum who has um, very strong support and many resources to bring in extra care into the home. And they may not admit to us until they're closer to later stage or even on a hospice situation. So really, really variable. Um, so which means that for those of you who work directly in uh, memory care, skilled nursing, things like that, and, and have lots of residents in your care who live with dementia, that the range can be so variable. And one of the things that I think is going to be so interesting to you when we get into Dr. Stelter's section here is the way in which proper programming within memory care can actually help to um, bring everyone, all the residents to their optimal potential and, and even the playing ground a little bit when it comes to what they're able to do for themselves in, their, in the dining situation. So we'll get to that here in a little bit. <clears throat> I mentioned a minute ago, we talk about some statistics, which I just think is important to kind of consider um, when we wanna understand a bigger picture of dementia. Um, again, finding averages when it comes to how dementia works for a, across a span of people is very challenging. So when we think about, you know, how long might a person live on average once they've received their dementia diagnosis? Well, the best average you can really come up with is around three to five years, but that again, so variable. Uh, a younger, generally more healthy individual uh, may, may have something like 15 to 20 years, depending on just the trajectory of their specific um, disease process. 
When it comes to, um, you know, we talk about people who, what age is kind of average here? So around 83, 84 years is an average diagnosis and uh, age for diagnosis, excuse me. And about one out of every three people over the age of 85 could be expected to have a diagnosis of dementia. I found that a little startling. Um, just because that seems very high to me, but some of you may not feel as much that way. They may see, yes, that's about, that's about what we tend to see as well in our communities. So yeah, let me know in the chat what you think. Um, when it comes to behavior issues, again, part of the reason why having dedicated memory care space can be so essential um, to excellent um, dementia care is because we have about two thirds of individuals who can be expected to experience sundowning. Um, about a third may become aggressive. Another, and again, a third may have those sleep issues, which means when we, we talk about 24 hour care, why that's so vital. Around 60% may experience wandering. And we really start to see, especially in those later, later stages, some concerns regarding nutrition. So a person's PO intake, and Dr. Stelter will talk a lot more about this in a minute. A person's PO intake or the amount that they're eating in a given meal or on a given day really raises their risk for malnutrition when it comes to dementia. And that can happen for a number of reasons. In those earlier stages, we may have someone who, whether they've been living at home or maybe an independent care, they may uh, not realize that they haven't eaten. As the mechanisms in the brain start to disconnect from the hunger and satiety feelings that you and I experience, we can have people who still know to make something for lunch and then forget to eat it. Maybe they think that they've eaten, but they never made food at all. So that can kind of start um, the downhill trend for a person, especially if they haven't yet moved into senior care of some kind, that they may experience more weakness, more falls, dehydration, things like that. So we'll get more into that in a little bit here. Okay, some quick statistics here looking at um, global and national um, expectations. So currently there's thought to be about 50 million cases of dementia worldwide, and that number is expected to triple by 2050. Part of the reason for that is because when we start with the baby boomer generation, and then we move through Gen X, millennials, things like that, the generations got so much bigger. When we talk about the silent generation, you know, that was around 46, 47 million individuals born really between uh, the Great Depression and the Second World War. And so there's so many fewer people between them and the greatest generation, which were the folks born at the beginning of uh, the 20th century. We have so many more individuals globally expected to um, age up through uh, the population. You know, I talk a lot about baby boomer generation in a lot of the presentations that I give. And what I think is so fascinating is what a global phenomenon that generation is. It wasn't just American GIs coming home from World, World War II and starting families. This was happening in countries around the world. So when we see these um, worldwide trends in things like dementia, we can look back at those sizes of those generations and understand where those numbers are coming from. In the US, there's an economic burden that comes with this disease progress. And it's around, in 2019, thought to be about $1.3 trillion um, US, with a time burden that lands on those informal caregivers as well, averaging about five hours a day. And five hours a day might not sound like a whole lot when we're talking about care for someone with dementia, but when we recognize that the caregivers in that case are often adult children, neighbors, folks more in their middle-aged years who have careers and younger families, um, a time burden of five extra hours a day of caregiving is actually a, a huge amount. We talked a minute about baby boomers. Don't need to repeat myself. You guys get it. <clears throat> Alrighty. So let me, in the interest of time, move through our next section here, nutrition for prevention and delay of dementia. So one of the kind of dietary patterns, I don't like to call it a diet because we're not talking about any kind of restriction. We're talking about um, enjoyment and abundance of foods that can help to preserve our cognitive function and our mental health. One of the dietary patterns linked so strongly to being able to pre prevent or even delay the onset of dementia is the mind diet. 
This dietary pattern is really a combination of the principles of the Mediterranean diet with the DASH diet. And the DASH diet is an acronym that stands for Dietary Approaches to Stop Hypertension. This is a lower sodium diet um, that really gears you towards similar patterns to the Mediterranean, like lots of whole grains, fresh fruits and vegetables, limited red meat and added sugar, activity and socialization, okay? This is for the part where I can get a little nerded out, you guys, so bear with me. I absolutely love understanding the mechanisms of action with nutritional biochemistry. That sounds like a lot, but bear with me. This is such cool stuff. So we talked in our objectives about wanting to understand what nutrients play a role in cognitive protection. The first one I'm going to talk about is omega-3s. Omega-3s, you will recognize that term and you probably are thinking something along the lines of fish oil, fatty fish, walnuts, foods like this that we know contain omega-3s. When dietitians such as myself urge individuals to um, up their intake of these foods that contain omega-3s, it's not just because people who eat fish are healthier. There's real science behind a lot of this. And in the case of omega-3s, we actually see that people with a higher circulating level of omega-3s in their bloodstream um, can connect to a, a higher synaptic transmission level and reduced oxidative stress. But one of the biggest things that I think is so fascinating about omega-3s is that they actually help control the amount of cortisol that your body will um, produce when given a certain stimulus. So if you imagine two versions of yourself a stressful event occurs to those two versions of yourself, the person who has higher circulating levels of omega-3s produces less cortisol. There's a whole biochemical cascade that occurs from understanding that you're perceiving stress all the way down to your cortisol being released. And omega-3s actually interrupt that process. So fascinating. So it can actually help to control the release of that stress hormone cortisol, which when we have a high level of cortisol um, in a kind of chronic situation, which many caregivers and healthcare professionals experience, we can actually decrease the impact of that a chronic high cortisol when we eat more omega-3s. So I could go off on that for a whole different talk. I'll come back and do that for you guys sometime. We then go move on to polyphenols, a specific polyphenol referred to as the flavin 3 alls These are antioxidants that we find in things like berries, red wine, coffee, and tea. And part of this is why you've heard for many years that blueberries are good for brain health. It is this particular types of polyphenols that when we eat them and digest those um, food components and nutrients, that the polyphenols, uh, the blue kind of bluish uh, purple compounds in those foods are actually rearranged by the gut microbiome, released into the bloodstream, and they can act directly on the nervous system to interfere with the amyloid beta assembly, the, the tau protein um, clusters that we've, we've uh, learned to link to the development of dementia, higher polyphenols can actually help to stop that aggregation. Isn't that cool? So when you hear a dietitian say, adding berries to your diet, here is one of the benefits. All right, moving through more of our nutritional biochem short course here. Fiber is one of my favorite topics to talk about because we have known for a long time that fiber can support um, bowel health, especially in the, in the prevention of colon cancer. We then became um, uh, learned to understand that a higher fiber diet can actually impact our heart health by keeping our cholesterol levels in check. And newer research now is pointing towards fiber as an integral piece of the mental and cognitive health puzzle. Because when we eat fiber, our gut microbiome can chew on that fiber that we can't fully digest. And the gut microbiome, the actual positive, good, beneficial bacteria that live in our gut, produce a, um, a substance called short chain fatty acids when they eat fiber. Short chain, short chain fatty acids, we do absorb. They move into our bloodstream. They have an anti-inflammatory effect on our bodies and they can actually um, interact with our central nervous system in ways that are becoming more and more well understood. Um, I think this is so fascinating that we're learning to understand that a higher fiber diet can have a direct impact on our cognitive and mental health. 
We know that we get our fiber from whole grains, nuts and seeds, lentils, beans, certain vegetables and fruit, and certain fortified foods and supplements as well. So if you're not already getting your 25 to 30 grams a day, something to consider ramping up over time for your cognitive health. Just a few more uh, nutrients here before we start to pivot into our second half. Uh, lutein and zeaxanthin are associated with reduced all-cause dementia. B vitamins are thought to help slow cognitive decline, especially folate. And then vitamin E, um, a adequate amount of vitamin E every day is associated with a slower functional decline related to your ADLs. Isn't that so interesting that a certain nutrient can have that connection? I would be remiss if I left you with the idea that nutrition is the only thing to think about when it comes to prevention. When we talk about the Mediterranean diet and other similar dietary patterns around the world, the, the other such important pieces of that are lifestyle factors like adequate exercise or physical movement, um, adequate sleep as much as possible, continuous learning, what you're all doing with us here today. Lifelong learning actually has a protective effect on our cognitive health. Having social connection and community, again, something that I think several of us may be working back towards since the pandemic, um, as we learn what the new shape of our social connections really looks like. And then of course, things that we can't necessarily control, the fact of our aging, our genetic makeup, things like that also play something of a role here. All right, so real quick here, we want to, before we get into Dr. Stelter's fantastic information, um, just talk a little bit about nutrition for individuals living currently with dementia and with the understanding that of all the information that we share here today regarding um, different types of foods, Mediterranean style eating, things like that, we always wanna maintain that sense of balance for our residents because we can put foods in front of them all day long, but if they're not enjoyable to that person, if they're unfamiliar, and then there, it is uh, all for naught, you know, if you will. We always want to focus on uh, making sure that our residents are well fed with foods they enjoy and have a balance of those foods that can help support their cognition, while also supporting whole body nutrition, enjoyment, familiarity, nostalgia, things like that. <clears throat> Speaking of enjoyment, that piece of chocolate cake is a pureed chocolate cake. And you could put that up on your Instagram and I will come to your community for dinner. <laughs> I think it looks amazing. Um, it's a really good example of things that we know about meeting individuals where they're at, if they're going through any of those chewing or swallowing difficulties, if there's been a diagnosis of dysphagia, we know that PO intake can be enhanced by presenting individuals with foods that closely resemble the original food. That can take a little extra work, a few extra steps, um, but there's definitely products, techniques, um, things like that that can help you meet that need. Okay. Uh, one other thing I wanted to touch on here is the idea of finger foods. Um, so in the same way that individuals who are on a puree diet um, or those different IDC levels may benefit from having recognizable foods, the same is true for finger foods. I think we are moving past the days where the finger foods extension on the menus said things like sandwiches, chicken fingers, things like that, because I think we're recognizing that for reasons of nutrition, dignity, enjoyment, socialization, that if you need to have finger food options for an individual, those should also closely resemble the original meal. So in this case, in that picture to the right, um, this original meal was baked salmon with Greek seasoning, uh, steamed green beans, and a baked sweet potato. In this finger foods iteration, um, we've actually taken the steps to uh, cut into bite-sized pieces that salmon prior to cooking. Because for those of you who are real hands-on in the kitchen, if you're a fish eater, you know that if you try to dice up a cut piece of fish, you get things that are flaking apart, maybe more difficult to hold on to. It might get mushy depending on the type of fish. So bite size before baking, we added a, an IQF cut um, green bean here. So easier to pick up individual pieces. And then we translated that baked sweet potato into a sweet potato waffle fry. And you're probably going, Jen, you're a dietitian. Why are you serving fries? Well, it's because we have space here to have a little bit higher caloric intake. We have a little more enjoyment, but also the flavor, the texture, that distinguishable kind of shape of the waffle fry 
very tactile. So someone who is eating with their hands will really feel that texture. Um, there's, there's just a little room for creativity here when it comes to your finger foods. So things to consider. All right, a few just kind of ending thoughts here. Um, start with what you already know. If you're finding that you're feeling um, some inspiration here to change some things around on your menu, a great place to start is if you have a cardiac diet extension um, or a cardiac diet program, that's a great place to start because what's good for the heart is generally good for the brain. If there's favorites from that cardiac menu, maybe that's something you can add more often or to an always available menu. Um, if you have those healthful mains your residents are already in love with, like I said, make them more available. Consider where you can feature fish uh, or other seafood on the menu. Enhance those leafy greens. Think about fresh fruit options. And when you're concerned about budget, because you're hearing me say like add fresh fruits and vegetables, you can balance this out with more budget friendly options like beans, lentils, whole grains, things like that. All right. So I wanna move through here so we can get over to our second half. Um, a few other things to consider, bringing in chef demos for continuous learning and learning about food products, trying new recipes. If you don't already have a specific culinary component to your resident council, that's a great way to consider um, ways to bring in new foods to have folks try before you make a big menu change to something that maybe your residents aren't as fond of. Bringing in a speaker to educate about nutrition, asking a farmer to come by to talk about how they grow their food. Um, because again, learning is cognitively protective. All right. I wanna go ahead and move over here to Dr. Stelter's um, slides because we have such excellent information for you here with really actionable um, ideas for a multi-sensory dining approach. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Jennifer Stelter. Thank you so much, Jen. I really appreciate it. And thank you everyone for joining us today. I know you're all very busy and it's exciting that we can offer these webinars prior to the conference. So we're happy that you're here. Um, so as Jen mentioned, I'm Dr. Jennifer Stelter. I am the owner of the Dementia Connection Institute. I'm a clinical psychologist by trade and a senior living consultant. I'm also the creator of the Dementia Connection model, which you'll learn about today, and the creator of the Dementia Connection Wellness Dining Program, which we'll talk uh, more in depth about. Um, I'm also the author of the Busy Caregiver's Guide to Advance Alzheimer's Disease, published by Johns Hopkins University Press. So glad to be here today. So let's hop in to talk further more about, you know, what causes poor eating for people living with dementia? Um, because, you know, we may have our assumptions when we see that they're not necessarily eating. We might think, oh, it's, it's the disease or it might be, you know, specifically, you know, uh, something that we had observed prior. And so we're assuming it's the same thing for today, but every day is different for someone living with dementia. And so look at all this on this slide. I'm not going to touch every single point, but I think some important things to note is definitely portion size. Um, so as the disease progresses for people living with dementia, they do find it difficult to make those decisions. And so when there's too many options for those decisions, they become overwhelmed quite easily. And so having limited uh, food choices or portions in front of them can really help move them along through the uh, meal process. And so uh, whether that's offering the um, meal in tiered steps or um, in different courses, we'll talk more about that, that can really help to kind of reduce that overall feelings of overwhelmness. Um, Sometimes they do have a reduced ability to taste and smell. And so if they're not getting those kind of uh, sensory triggers, you know, then they might not necessarily think to eat. Um, if they are feeling any kind of negative um, feelings at all, they may not want to eat. And we'll talk more about that as it can see through the lens of the dementia connection model here shortly. Um, in the later stages, we might see that they may not recognize actually what food is, what the purpose of it is anymore, what the meaning is. And so if it's meaningless, they won't think to put it in their mouth to need to eat it to provide their body with nutrition nutrition. Um, orientation. I mean, think about this. I mean, we base pretty much our, our parts of our day based on our meals that we eat, right? Breakfast is in the morning, lunch is during the day, dinner is at night. And so if they don't know what time of day it is, they might not even think that it's time to eat. Um, you know, sometimes there could be some medical challenges going on, whether that is mouth pain, GI issues, hand dexterity problems, arthritis, neuropathy, right? All of this we have to take into account when it, you know, the process of eating itself. Um, there's a little bean in the, our, our brain that actually triggers us and tells us we're hungry. 
So as the disease progresses, unfortunately, this does dissipate over time. And so in the later stages, that is when they really start to not want to eat. Um, but more so, there's so much before that that can happen that deter them from eating as we're talking about now. Um, let's think about the environment, right? Um, there's a lot of potential noise, um, busy patterns, the temperature in the room. If you have larger dining rooms with other residents other than those who have dementia, right? There's just that, that kind of feelings of overwhelmness can come about them just in the environment alone. So we have to take into consideration if individual dementia under your care are being triggered. Okay, next slide, please. Um, and then the, you know, the actual, um, act of nourishing ourselves can become compromised, right? So we talked about poor eating, but nutrition itself, Jen mentioned a few things, but what is really important to note is that as the person progresses through the disease, that their food preferences will likely change. They will likely start to prefer foods that they enjoyed when they were younger. And so sometimes, unfortunately, that does leave us with uh, cookies and candy and those kinds of things. So think more sweeter foods they're going to want versus more of like the spicy or salty foods. Um, so we have to kind of move with their preferences as the disease progresses in order to keep them wanting to eat. Now, we know that some of the sweeter foods aren't necessarily always the healthiest, but we can swap those out sometimes. So instead of, you know, providing them with um, candies and cookies, right, if they're looking for that sweetness, we can add applesauce to like their vegetables and things like that. So they're still getting nourished with some of those important foods that we need to keep in mind. Um, also, as I mentioned earlier, is that they may not remember what food does for them. And so uh, that can really deter them, um, especially too, if that little bean in, the, in their brain is, is deteriorating and they don't have the trigger to want to eat. Um, this is where we start to see maybe their, their mouth clench up where they don't want to open it. They might spit out food or throw their utensils because they're not understanding the purpose of all of this. And so really their body's not being nourished the way that it needs to. And then they may have some difficulty in chewing and swallowing. So we'll talk more about how to kind of work around this in order to continue to work those muscles, you know, of their uh, esophagus and whatnot. So next slide, please. So I want to introduce to you, if you've not heard of the Dementia Connection Model. Um, it's a model that I developed over a 10 year period of implementation and data research. And it really was a labor of love um, of, you know, kind of where this started from. And as I was developing, I actually didn't even know I was developing a model of care. Um, I started to really teach about and educate, um, you know, caregivers in long term care, families, the community about dementia care. And people said, you know, Dr. Selter, the way that you explain it just makes a lot of sense. And you know, some have said, like, I'm a nurse for 25 years and I've never heard explained this way, but this makes sense to me. How did I never know this before? And really it was pulling together a lot of the research that has been present in dementia care and collaborating with a, a lot of wonderful professionals in the industry around it. Um, and then I started to add tools to this aspect so that way we have hands-on tools that we can use every day. Um, and from there, from the dementia connection model, evolved a different aspects of how to apply this to different parts of your caregiving process, including, of course, dining as well. And so uh, to dive into the Dementia Connection model, there's actually three pillars that came with this model of care. The first is the theory of retrogenesis. The second is using sensory-based information. And the third is the active habilitation. So with the theory of retrogenesis, this was actually developed by Dr. Barry Reisberg a few decades ago. And in his research, he actually showed that as individuals progress through the disease, they're moving towards a younger state. So all of their skill sets are actually reversing towards infancy. So you probably have heard some version of this before. So we can thank Dr. Reisberg for his wonderful research for identifying that. But I want to take it a step further. You know, what he identified was people actually moderate to late stage, their, their chronological age will not match their developmental age. And so developmentally, he actually coined that they are anywhere from seven years old to four weeks old, if you can believe that, right? And he actually took the physical brain of someone advancing through the disease who had since passed and a seven-year-old child who had passed, and they were exactly the same size brain. And so he was really able to be specific as to where do we start to see this kind of reverse, right? 
and how to really connect with people living with dementia. And so um, part of this I tell you because as caregivers, this allows us a little bit more insight into the world that they live in, right? We can put ourselves in their shoes to understand, okay, if they are developmentally a five-year-old, a three-year-old, a two-year-old, then of course they can't do all the things we expect them to do, right? I mean, think about when infants are learning to eat, right? They start, still, they start off with bottle feeding or breastfeeding. Then they move towards utilizing their fingers, but more of, you know, finger type foods and softer foods that they can swallow that they won't necessarily choke on, right? And then they move to more of um, foods that are palatable to them at that age and so on and so forth. Then their feeding skills grow as they watch and listen to their parents or their caregivers and teach them how to feed themselves. And eventually they learn how to feed themselves, right? So taking us back to childhood, all the skills that we learned in the first seven years of life, we didn't learn it by reading a book. We learned it by watching and listening. So what that means is that because young ones use their senses, people living with dementia as they progress through the disease, according to Dr. Barry Reisberg's theory, they will actually use their senses to navigate this new world, right? And so you probably have heard the saying that people living with dementia will navigate or they'll live in a new world different from you and I. And that's what this means is that they're relying on their senses quite a bit more than you and I do as more cognitively intact adults, right? Because you and I, we, we are influenced by our senses, but we can decide to change those things if we don't necessarily like that sense or we don't like what we're hearing or seeing, you know, things like that. We can change that. But people with dementia they don't know or have the problem solving abilities to change necessarily those things in the moment that make them uncomfortable. So what they do is they actually show us through their behaviors that they're uncomfortable, right? Whether that's wandering or that's some agitation or that's repeating themselves or isolating, right? That's how they show us what they're feeling inside. So with, the, with sensory based information, how sensory-based information is actually processed in our brain is very important for us to understand. So we know what tools we can use to connect to that person with dementia. So physiologically, when any sensory-based information comes into our brain, whether that's in our through our eyes, through our mouth, our nose, our ears, right, our fingertips, it's processed first in the kind of designated area in our brain, and then it goes to the limbic system. This all happens within seconds, so quick. So in our uh, limbic system of our brain, we have two very important organs. We have our amygdala, which generates emotions, and our hippocampus, which generates memories. So when sensory-based information comes in, either negative or positive, it will actually influence how we feel, our emotions, to match that sense, right? If it was negative, it would be a negative feeling, positive, positive feeling. And then we have a memory of that event. Now, you and I will have a memory of that event in terms of We'll know what happened. We'll know who was there, those kinds of things. But for people with dementia, they won't necessarily remember all those details, but they'll remember how they feel with you providing that sensory-based information. So if it's a negative stimuli, they're going to remember that negative feeling with you. If it's a positive stimuli, they'll remember that positive stimuli with you. So you probably have heard that people with dementia, they don't remember your name or your job role, but they remember how they feel with you. That's what that means. Okay. So once that physiological reaction occurs, there's a psychological process that happens afterwards where their behaviors become influenced based on the feelings that they experienced. So you can imagine if they were experiencing negative emotions, they're going to have negative behaviors, positive emotions, positive behaviors, right? And so I was able to duplicate this in, in my research time and time again, whether it was through ADL care or it was dining or it was communication, right? Where we were able to see the connection between the sensory based information coming in and the end result of the behavior and the affect on their face. Okay. And so I'm very proud to say that Johns Hopkins coined the dementia connection model, the very first cognitive behavioral theory in dementia care. Now, the third pillar here, let's talk about that habilitation. This simply means we're going to habilitate them by using the same sensory based information that's been successful, we're gonna use this over and over again. So every single day, the same way. So when we talk about dining, it's a very structured process where you're gonna use the same tools with your residents, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So we're gonna get into that here in a second. Uh, next slide, please. 
So let's move into what is this wellness dining program? Uh, I've been able to successfully duplicate it, which is wonderful. We're getting into some of the data here at the end of the original focus group that was done in 2016. Um, and I'm happy to say that we're able to provide this, um, you know, to a lot of our um, our communities and, and those who are in the senior living industry. So we're going to go through each sense and I'm going to identify what was successful in the original pilot, um, as well as what's been shown in, in evidence based research to support what we're doing. So let's talk about auditory, what we hear. OK, and so, of course, I'm sure you've heard music is just one of the unbelievable interventions that we can use in all areas of dementia care. And specifically, we can use it in dining, too. And so when we think about some of the research that's out there, so there's actually was research done at a Harvard University looking at the type of music to play based on the time of day. So I use this research to be able to implement what should we play for breakfast, for lunch and for dinner. So they're saying in the morning, you should use upbeat music with words that the residents recognize. So if you, you know, we talk about the baby boomer phase, right? So uh, music of their era, right, that they enjoy listening to. Now, specifically with words, because oftentimes when we hear a song that we like, we will sing it to ourselves or maybe aloud or we'll hum to ourselves, right? Or say the words in our head. So the idea here is in the morning after sleeping all night, we want the people with dementia to be able to brush off those cobwebs, be able to use their verbal skills again in the morning and get comfortable with their words, right? Um, so we can do that by something so safe by uh, a tune that they recognize. For lunch, we're gonna use upbeat music, no words. So think kind of background music that's still upbeat, but not necessarily recognizable, kind of like elevator music maybe, right? Or maybe the music that you listen to at your dentist office, right? Um, so it's still enjoyable music, but this allows them to be sociable and not be distracted by the words during the day. And then for dinner, we're gonna use non biharmic music because we're gonna already start the calming process to reduce any sundowning symptoms. And so non biharmic means one tone or one instrument being played. So maybe that's uh, classical with a guitar or maybe that's classical with you know a harp. And if it's individualized, maybe if you're working with one resident, maybe you, have, you work with this person individually, you would play the instrument that they enjoy, right? But for a larger group or community, right, you can kind of get a census for what instruments that they like or try a variety and see which one kind of sticks, which one they enjoy, right? And so by doing this, we talk about, again, habilitation, you're going to use the same music for each type of, um, uh, of a, each meal. And so in the pilot program, what I did was I actually downloaded music off of Apple iTunes, and I simply just made a breakfast folder, a lunch folder, and a dinner folder for the staff. So that all they had to do was press the folder and hit play. And so it was very easy for them. So that can be completed in the beginning of your dining program before it's actually implemented live for your residents to in your staff to utilize. Okay, next slide, please. Olfactory, what we smell. There's been intensive research with essential oil use. And at the Dementia Connection Institute, this is one of many uh, tools that we use when we talk about quality dementia care. And so there's thousands of clinical trials that support the use of essential oil use in dementia care. Um, and so specifically, when you look at the research, you're going to see that any citrus essential oil actually is great for increasing appetite, except for one citrus oil, which is grapefruit. If you have those residents or a resident who is challenged with the, you know, uh, maybe being overweight or maybe they're diabetic and, you know, due to weight issues, type 2 diabetes, right? Grapefruit essential oil will be your go-to to help them to curb their appetite. Otherwise, if you have residents who are losing weight and or they're not interested in food, a citrus essential oil is great for that, okay? And so what you'll do is there's kind of two ways you can use essential oils in the dining process. The most, or I would say the least intimidating way, not most, but the least intimidating way is through a diffuser of some sort, okay? With a diffuser, it's simple. You wanna make sure that the, the diffuser itself is actually the square footage of your dining room. So that way it fills nicely, right? If it's too big, the smell might be overwhelming. If it's too small, you may not be able to smell the smell, right? And so it's important that we have a proper square footage. And it's easy, you just take off the lid, Sometimes there's a, a top component as well. So you just kind of wiggle that off. You There's a line in all diffusers. So you fill the diffuser to the line. 
Um, and then from there, um, you add your, your um, oil itself. So about five drops is, is, is perfectly fine. If you have a much larger space, then you would have a larger diffuser and maybe 10 drops of a citrus essential oil. Now, when you're filling the diffuser, make sure you use bottled or distilled water. Do not use tap water. Um, I know here in Illinois, we have an allowable level of metals in our water. And so we don't want that hitching a ride to our brain. Remember, this is gonna go into our limbic system. So we don't want that to happen. So we want clean water in here at all times, okay? Um, and so you just press it on and there you go. So you start about 15 to 20 minutes, you know, 15 to 30 minutes prior to each meal. So the air can fill with the actual essential oil itself. Now, what's interesting is that, you know, kind of a side story, uh, when I was uh, producing the, the pilot, um, we would, again, 15, 30 minutes prior to each meal, we would start the music and we would um, use the diffuser. And about a month into this pilot, all of a sudden, you know, normally we'd have staff that would escort the residents to the dining area and they would be um, kind of help to facilitate the meal to get started. But about a month later, we actually saw residents escorting themselves to the dining area because they smelled the smell and they heard the music. So they knew it was time to eat. So that's when I knew that with the dementia connection model, there was not only an immediate reaction, but there was also a long-term effect when you use the same consistent tools. They were learning what these tools meant, where they should be and what they should be doing. That is the best gift you can give someone with dementia. So wonderful, wonderful. Um, also what you can use is uh, we have at the Institute called personal diffuser dots. So kind of just show you what that is. You put a couple of drops onto the dot itself. You kind of put it hidden somewhere in their lapel area and they have a personal diffuser all day. So you can add the citrus if you have somebody who typically will kind of doesn't like to sit and eat. They kind of wander around. Maybe you give them a sandwich so they can wander around safely and eat. Um, but the citrus is great for that. Citrus is also great for improving mood. So lots of clinical trials on that. So having happy, hungry residents before you're about to start your dining process is the best recipe for success. So use that citrus. Next slide, please. Uh, I'm going to kind of move quickly through this. I know we're running out of time, but just making sure we're being specific about the oil we're using. So for dining, citrus would be great. But if you do have residents, maybe in the later part, like in dinner time, maybe they don't have appetite challenges, but they really get irritated or agitated during that time, then you might try a lavender essential oil, which is all things calming. Next slide, please. Tactile, what we touch, right? So think about what they touch in the dining process. So this might be actually touching the chair, a real chair that they can sit in rather than their dining chair or the wheelchair, excuse me. Um, using adaptable equipment, this is a great way to kind of bring in occupational therapy for an evaluation to see if they're not using their utensils anymore or they're challenged with the, you know, maybe the, the uh, plates that they're using or things like that. It's important that we evaluate what they can use. There's a lot of adaptable equipment out there from, you know, larger lips on the plates so they don't, you know, food doesn't slide off so easily, dividers so they don't get overwhelmed by the amount of food that's on there, um, you know, using cups with lids with spout so they don't spill when they're drinking, you know, using thicker utensils in case they have arthritis or neuropathy. That's a really important part of this process. But at some point they move, may move to bite-sized foods and that's what Jen was talking about earlier. So making sure that it looks desirable and that they can easily put it in and enjoy the same nutrition as everyone else does in a more dignified fashion. Next slide, please. Um, you know, for those who cannot feed themselves, there's a great technique and the Dementia Connection model supports Tipa Snow's work. And she developed the hand under hand technique. And so if you get a chance to go to YouTube, um, you can learn about the hand under hand technique, but essentially it's connecting the arm and the uh, kind of brain together to really brush off the cobwebs of our procedural memory of actually the act of eating. And so by assisting the individual with this hand under hand technique, where we're actually moving their hand towards their mouth, in my pilot study, I was able to, with a couple of staff, be able to kind of let go and the resident just keeps feeding themselves. So great work for Tipa Snow. Next slide, please. Visual what we see, okay? And so there's actually been a lot of research around this and um, a study that comes to mind is done, it was done by Boston University actually, looked at red color plateware and yellow color plateware. And it actually it had them increase their consumption by 24% for those who were in the study. Um, when we think about red and yellow, right? 
When you think about those colors together, what is the most famous fast food restaurant out there? McDonald's, right? We've all been duped by this. So I apologize for kind of killing the buzz there, but we've all been duped by that billion dollar advertising, but it worked for people with dementia too. So we need to move away from our traditional plateware that we usually have in, res in our residential communities, whether that is, you know, a, a white or a beige, you know, or maybe a darker color, it needs to be bold. So red actually increases appetite, yellow sustains attention. So you can alter it based on what the residents need. But we also took this a step further in the pilot where we actually um, plate of the food based on the color of the plate or vice versa. You know, we put the um, color of the food on the plate that would be, um, they would be mismatched, right? So it would be, it would stick out. And we actually saw higher consumptions when we did that. So darker color foods look better on a yellow plate and lighter foods, foods look better on a yellow plate. Um, so they're contrasting um, is, is what I'm trying to get at. Also um, visually, again, cutting down the amount of food in front of them so they're not overwhelmed. And if they're on a puree diet, serve it in a bowl because liquid in a bowl looks like soup. It's much more palatable and more desirable. We actually saw higher uh, meal percentages go up when we serve puree in bowls versus plates. Next slide, please. Gustatory, what we eat. So just real quick here is just, again, we know that their favorite foods might be more sweeter foods, more junk kinds of foods. We can mix it in with the Mediterranean diet all in moderation, um, making sure we are encouraging fruits and vegetables, maybe putting that sweeter applesauce on top so they'll eat it. We may have to do some supplementation, but I'll talk about how I was able to reduce that in the pilot study. And then hydration is so important. Next slide, please. Um, also, when we think about um, softer foods, again, we may have to move towards like apple sauces, cottage cheese, you know, foods that are softer consistency. So that way there's no choking hazards, but that's a great referral to your speech therapist. Next slide, please. Multisensory. So again, we may uh, be able to eat with them can be a possibility so they we can show because they they watch us, they learn from us. And so if we can show them how to eat again, they likely will follow along with us. Next slide, please. And then again, consider the mood of the room, right? So making sure that there are no kind of distractors out there, that we're handling those as quickly as we can um, to make sure that the overall environment is calm. Next slide, please. So the results of the pilot program were unbelievable. So I had implemented this in a memory care assisted living for three months. And the results are shown here. So 46% of residents actually increase, increase their food consumption. These were residents who were eating less than um, 80%. 54% of residents either gained or maintained weight who were already losing weight. And 72% of residents that were on supplements no longer needed them. They were eating real food again. So we were able to discontinue those orders. And at this particular facility, the assisted living was actually paying for the supplements. And so it actually saved them $9,000 in three months, which was a $40,000 savings in one year. So implementing the Dementia Connection Wellness Dining Program is a return on your investment. Next slide, please. So some key takeaways from today, you know, with the dementia onset, you know, maybe delayed, you know, we can try and lower our risk for developing dementia by really eating nutritious types of foods that Jen had pointed out. But we can't forget those who have also have dementia can benefit from these very same foods and some of the very same processes. But we have to make sure we're implementing this in a structured dining program for them that focuses on what their senses will experience in positive ways. Because remember this process, if we provide positive stimulation, it will actually provide a positive physiological reaction, influencing emotion and memory, a connection with you, and also promoting positive behaviors where they'll want to eat and they will want to sit and socialize and they'll want to be able to nourish themselves in positive ways and it provides better quality outcomes and a return on your investment. And with that, I wanna thank you so much for today. I know we're closely at time here um, and we'll address any questions that we can if you're able to stick around, thank you. Oh my goodness, Jen and Dr. Stelter, that was just phenomenal. I truly enjoyed every, every bit, uh, so many wonderful morsels uh, that you shared with us, so real and so practical and so doable. Um, so thank you so, so very much for sharing this with everyone. Um, I don't see um, any questions right now in the chat. So let me just share a couple of things with you before we leave, um, before I lose you all. So Janet's going to pop something up on the screen here for me. Oops, 
here we go. <laughs> it's it's a oh it's a Wednesday. It was today? Well, no, today's yet yeah, today's Tuesday. I don't even know what day it is. Here we go. Um, so again, for the continuing education, um, we do offer the CEs for nursing home administrator and nurses. Nurses, you will get a separate survey. I believe Janet put something in the um, chat. I know we had several people that asked questions about other disciplines, certainly uh, some registered dietitians who are on this with us. If you would like a certificate of attendance on the survey, there's a place for you to put your state and your license. Would you go ahead and type in there? that you're an RD um, and then I will, I'll be able to look at the reports and I'll see who that is and I'll be sure that those people get um, a certificate of attendance. Our goal is to be person-centered. That's what this whole movement is about. So we're going to do our best. Please be patient. It may take us a little bit of time to get those all out to everyone. Uh, Janet, is there another slide? Huh? We uh, certainly hope that... Um, that you'll be able to join, many of you are able to join us at the conference, the uh, Grow Boulder, which is uh, November 11th through 14th in Grand Rapids. If you haven't checked it out, please go to the website and take a look at it. Lots of great presentations, lots of, lots of programming on dementia. Um, it, it's certainly a topic that is so important for so many of us to understand. Uh, tours, Lots more CEs available. Um, and so uh, we hope you can join us there. Janet, you want to pop on to the next slide? Because we're losing people. So I'm going to try to get you fast before I lose you all. Um, there is a great, there's also the other things that are offered through Center for Innovation and Greenhouse Project, um, working toward equity and the aging experience. Uh, Marvell Adams is going to be doing a podcast. I, it doesn't say it on here, but I believe that's tomorrow. Um, if you look on the website, you'll find that. And uh, Marvell is actually one of our speakers um, at a pre-conference intensive. So some, some wonderful people out there sharing such incredible knowledge. And it's helping us, as we just learned, that lifelong learning will help us to in, in our with our cognitive health. So pay attention to that. Is there anything else there, Janet? Is there another, is there another slide or was that the end? Nope, that's it. And yes, that's, that's the end. So the again, thank you all so very much. Anything else I should be saying, Janet? I just was going to going to um, confirm that the podcast will be tomorrow. Ah. I also put some a link in the uh, chat for um, finding out more information about our conference, so you can go there and see that information. And I would just like to again, Jen uh, and Dr. Stelter, thank you so very much. This was thank just you. it was wonderful. It was just wonderful. Thank you so much for having us. Yes, we appreciate it. And thanks to all who joined us. Jen, Jen, can we share the slides? Yes, yeah, you certainly okay. can. I did see that one question as it was coming through. Um, I can do a PDF if that works for you guys. Oh, I we'll can go ahead sure and put I... it in. I'll I'll go ahead and put it okay. into PDF handout. Okay. And then sure. what I'll do is I'll attach it to um because we'll leave the session up in the week and we'll put the recording of the session on the Great. conference site. Are you on the conference app? I, I don't believe I am, no. Okay. If you would like to, I can send you an invitation to be on the conference app. And that way, if people want to okay. chat with you, they would be able to do that. That would be great. Yeah, because I was going to say, we. Um, I, I neglected to get our contact information up on a final slide there. So hopefully people have, okay. and you're welcome to share our emails. Both okay, our emails. we can share that too. Okay, we'll great. make sure that awesome. gets, I'll make sure that gets updated. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you very, very thank much. You. Have a wonderful day. You too. Bye, ladies. Bye-bye.